Witam wszystkich bardzo serdecznie w pierwszym odcinku kolejnego sezonu podcastu About Time, w którym rozmawiamy o rzeczach, które są ważne i ciekawe. O rzeczach pozwalających zrozumieć mechanizmy rządzące jednostkami, społeczeństwem, a także czasami wręcz wszechświatem. Moje rozmowy dotyczą równowagi, balansu w życiu, budowania zdrowych nawyków i takich, które pozwalają utrzymać pozytywny mindset. Moim gościem jest dr Greg Wells, założyciel Wells Performance, fizjolog, sportowiec, wyczynowiec, profesor, trener, autor. W swojej pracy wykorzystuje badania światowych liderów w dziedzinie snu, odżywiania, sprawności fizycznej, sposobu myślenia i wydajności człowieka przy tworzeniu swojego życia i jego scenariuszy. Hello Greg, how are you? Fabulous. Thank you for that introduction. I heard a few words that I recognized, but uh, it was long and I, I appreciate you having me on the show. Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope you recognize your name. This would be something heard, that you should I heard have. my name. I heard professor. I heard scientist. I heard the ripple effect. So I think there's a few things in there that I, that I caught, but, but not, not much. <laughs> Fine. Well, I, I, I can explain it to you later. But now uh, getting to the point, because what, what I would love to uh, talk with you about is uh, performance optimization. And first, I would like to hear your definition of it. How do you define it? Right now, I'm thinking about performance optimization in that I would like people to be healthy, free of disease, free of illness experiencing well-being, which means that you are thriving in your life and that you're able to perform to your true potential, and that's different for everybody, in the areas that you care about the most. So if you are into business, then you're healthy, you have a thriving home life, and you're doing really well at your job. That's kind of the idea behind what we're trying to do right now is sort of health, well-being, and high performance all wrapped up in one. And and uh, obviously we're not going to get there all of the time, but hopefully we can get there a little bit more than we're getting there right now. Okay, so what, what do you think are the key factors uh, to contribute the overall well-being that you mentioned? I think that there's really three primary areas that people can focus on when it comes to the foundation of health and well-being before we leap into high performance. And the foundation revolves firstly about sleep. I really want people to sleep well. That's when the brain washes itself out. That's when we release hor growth hormone that heals, repairs, and regenerates the tissues of our body. That's when we regulate leptin and ghrelin, which helps us to control our nutrition. And when we sleep well, that sets the stage for mental and physical health. The second aspect to think about is your nutrition and healthy eating, which is really simple. It just means drink a lot of water eat as the rainbow when it is available to you, as little processed food as possible, and as little sugar as possible. So just eat your typical, um, and, and the wonderful thing about Eastern Europe, and I know we're speaking in Poland today, is that if we look at traditional styles of eating from all over the world, in general, they're very healthy. It's more the processed foods that have entered into our world more recently that are causing most of the problems. So we're literally just like eat, saying that we just want to be eating the, the traditional style of eating and as much of the rainbow as possible from your fruits and vegetables, minimize processed foods, and you're, and you're probably going to do really well when it comes to your nutrition. And then the third piece of the puzzle when it comes to our overall health and well-being is just being generally physically active. Now, if you want to go to the gym and lift weights, that's fine. If you want to do a yoga class, that's great. But in general, we're just looking for people to sit a little bit less and move a little bit more. And the easiest way for people to track how they're doing on that is by taking a look at the number of steps that they're taking through the day. Literally, that is the number one thing that we're coaching people on right now is just increasing the number of steps. And if you're at 1,000 steps per day, no big deal. Just go to 2,000. Um, if you're at 5,000, that's great. Maybe bump it up to 7,000 with a little walk at lunch. Uh, and if you're over 12,000, then you know what? That's a half marathon. Uh, sorry, that's a, about a 10-kilometer 10, 10 run. That's, that's, more than, that's more than enough. And you can probably head back to the office. You're all, you're all good. Perfect. These are very general recommendations that actually works for everyone. What um, about tailoring this performance optimization? Uh, how to make uh, individual strategies for your well-being? 
You know, I had an opportunity to speak to a gentleman named Troy Taylor recently, and he was the director of sports science for the United States ski and snowboard teams. So he had some of the highest performing athletes on the planet, and they were getting ready for the Olympics. And I had him on the podcast, and we've been old friends. So I, say, I said, hey, Troy, what are you guys working on right now? What's the secret thing that you're working on leading into the Olympics? And he said, there isn't one. We're just trying to make sure that everybody shows up to work out every single day. So for them, consistency is the secret. And there was a very big study that was done on NCAA athletes in the United States in the university system, looking at the number of uh, a number of different factors when it came to performance. They looked at males, females, age, nutrition, mental skills, weight training, all of those sorts of things, trying to figure out what were the factors that determined whether or not the athlete was going to be high performing or not. And the only factor that they could find that was directly correlated with their results in competition was the number of practices that the athletes showed up to. Literally, they just showed up to work out. And so although my tactics seem very general and they apply to everybody, the reality is we all have a human body. These are universal human truths. They work for everyone. The grand challenge that we're faced with, though, for all of us, is consistently applying them. A number of people will go to the gym for a little bit and then stop or eat healthy for a week and then and then maybe not do so or will sleep sometimes well but not you know often well. And so all of my focus right now is helping people to do health and wellness tactics in a sustainable, consistent way and it doesn't matter where you start as little as 3 minutes of exercise a day is enough to make a difference. So we're looking at the smallest possible change that you can make that you can apply consistently forever. Now, the way that we make this individualized is asking people to think about what do you love to do? So for example, in the hour before sleep, what is it that you love to do that helps you to decompress, relax, and deactivate so that you can fall asleep and to stay asleep? So for me, that is something like reading science fiction. I just love science fiction. It has nothing to do with my job. So it helps me to disconnect from work so I can fall asleep and stay asleep. When it comes to healthy nutrition, we ask people, you know, what are some things that you absolutely love to eat that are good for you? And we all know what that is. So for me, it's berries in the in the afternoon. And I like having nuts in the morning as my snacks. I love I really enjoy those two things. And when I have them around, I eat them and then I don't get tempted to go and do um, something that maybe isn't aligned with my dreams and goals. And when it comes to your physical activity, we ask people to think about what is it that you love to do? Is Do you love going for a walk with your friends in the park? Do you love going to the gym and lifting weights? Do you love yoga? Uh, whatever it is that you enjoy, it's easy for you to install that in your life and make that part of your life forever. So we look at consistency and then we look at what is it that you enjoy and that's where we go after our individualization. I know this seems ridiculously simple, and perhaps people are expecting some magic trick that I have up my sleeve, but honestly, this works for the highest performing individuals in the planet, whether it's sports, business, music, drama, science. It is a universal human truth. The challenge, the hard part, though, is the consistency over an extended period of time. Hmm. Sounds like a love-based habits, which uh, <laughs> uh, probably right? we should implement in our everyday uh, Why life. not? It just makes life good. Like, think about that. I've never actually heard that before, like a love-based habit. I love that idea. <laughs> I'm totally going to um, start saying that. I'll, I will credit you for that. But imagine that we install love-based habits yeah. and how great that could make our lives versus trying to take things out of our life. And that's really, really hard. So I love that that idea. Um, it's super cool, and I'm super. Um, I'm just very, very grateful that you brought that up. That's so cool. <laughs> uh, welcome, then. I, I'm happy to just have this. I mean, it just came from what you are saying. So it's your, 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 your actually. We'll share that one. We'll exactly. high five on that one. That yeah. was a joint. That was a joint <laughs> brainstorm. Good job. <laughs> okay, so. What about goals? Because in this kind of performance, I mean, the, uh, even if you heard the word, it kind of 
has a tension in it because it kind of requires uh, um, some effort and some effect. So what about, how, how do you think the goal is important for this uh, performance optimization? It's very important. There's a lot of research that shows that when we set goals and we're clear about our goals, it makes it more likely that we will achieve our goals. I often refer to it as imagine, I think the vast majority of people go through life and by analogy are you know shooting arrows and then walking over and trying to draw the bullseye on the targets that they've shot at. I much prefer us to think about drawing the targets and then shoot the arrows. That's just a simple analogy for people to think about about why it's worthwhile setting goals and, and why it's worth thinking about your goals. The way that we encourage people to think about it is to get some paper out, give yourself a couple of hours to think, and really dream about what it is that you want to try to achieve. Now, when we talk about dreaming, we're thinking big. Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. And that was part of what made his message so compelling was that it was a dream. It was something that was big. It was something that was maybe possible, but quite challenging. And over and over and over again, we've seen people use those terms. There was a um, moment during the 2010 Olympics when Petra Majdic from, I think, Slovenia, uh, it was a cross-country skier, and she crashed during her warm-ups and broke her ribs. She broke four ribs. She went on to race anyway and ended up winning a bronze medal. Just, and she did that bronze medal performance with four broken ribs and actually a pneumothorax where one of the ribs punctured a lung and one of her lungs collapsed. She went immediately to the hospital. She was okay. But in the press conference, they said, Petra, how did you do that? It must have been so painful. And she said, what I went through today racing to win that bronze medal was nothing compared to the 25 years of training that I did to try to reach my dream. So the first step is to think about the dream. What does your dream life look like? And it's okay. And I don't to, to, to think big, it's okay to dreamscape this a little bit. I don't, I don't want you to do this based upon what you're seeing on Instagram or social or comparing yourself to other people. I would like for you to really think about what is it that is meaningful to you, not to you know what you expect from other people or even what your partner in, in life. I want this to be all about you. It's, and that's okay. It's not selfish. This is science. So think about what you want, what your dream is. That's the big picture. Once we have that sorted out, we then set our goals. Our goals are limited to the next year. In the next 12 months, what is it that you want to accomplish towards that dream. Keep this tangible, make sure that it's very, very clear, make sure that it's as defined as you can possibly make it. So this is converting dreams into reality, but setting the time frame of about one year out. The next thing we ask you to do is to think about it in terms of four quarters. Businesses do this by encouraging you to do this yourself. And in each of the four quarters, we set objectives. So in this quarter, you don't need to do them all, you just do one at a time. So in the next quarter, in the next three months, what is it that you're going to accomplish moving you towards your goals? This can be very tactical because we're now down into the three month range. Like this is a very narrow window that we're going to focus on one specific thing. In that zone, you might have two or three objectives, but really we're keeping this very, very focused. One further step that we then ask people to take, once you're clear about the two or three things you want to accomplish this quarter, is you plan out your three weekly wins. And we typically recommend that people do this on Sunday night or Monday morning, so that you know this week, what are the three things that you are going to accomplish to move you towards your goals and your dreams? So we think big picture my whole life, then we think about goals in terms of a year, objectives in terms of this quarter, and then three weekly wins. Now imagine you go through 100, well, 52 weeks and you have three weekly wins. That's over 150, maybe even 156 if you do the math right. Um, 156 little wins that you will have in the next 12 months leading you towards your dream. And then success becomes inevitable. Hmm. Uh, it's very, yeah, it's very interesting and make it doable because when you think dream, as you said at the at the very beginning, it's sometimes you, it's just not achievable. And then when you kind of cut it into this uh, quarters and then weeks and days, perhaps it's it, it seems really 
much more real than at the uh, very beginning. Which well, bring- interesting enough, like imagine, sorry to interrupt, um, imagine looking back four years. You could probably imagine looking back 10 years. Most of us could never have imagined where we are today. And I'll bet you that we are far further along in our lives than we would have dreamt possible. And so when we look back, we can gain some confidence that by looking forwards and imagining things, we can craft that reality. So um, anyway, I just encourage people to give yourself permission to dream a little bit. And that's that's totally okay. And again, I'm so sorry to have interrupted there. No, no, no worries. Uh, uh, what, what, I, what I'm thinking is that with the dreams, we don't really have expectations, you know. And then when you set a goal, it's a different story. And most people are just not really willing to have this kind of uh, uh, responsibility to take it. So with dreaming, I think it's easier. So it's a nice start to just have a kind of direction or, you know, the focus, the zoom of, of the way we wanted to live in one year, two years or 10 years. So it's much yeah, easier. And the other really interesting word that you just used is responsibility. So there's a way of spelling responsibility, which is the traditional way, which is includes an I in the middle. I actually like to break the word in two, into response dash ability because this is your ability to respond to what's happening respond to your life instead of reacting which is how the vast majority of the world functions something happens and they react to it almost out of instinct with no plan whereas when we are responsible about our dreams when we're responsible about our goals when we're responsible about our objectives and we are responsible about our weekly wins, we make progress inevitably. So if we can shift from responsibility to response ability, that's where we can actually gain some control psychologically over the direction that we're going in our lives. So I'm psyched that you again brought up that amazing word. Um, and I, I appreciate you leading me in the direction that I want to go with your thinking. <laughs> this is This is perfect. So I hope that's helpful for people as well. Just a little mindset shift. Yeah, it kind of gives you the power of control of your life. So, so I'm I'm sure it's a, it's a huge uh, attitude for hopefully most of us. Um, when we are talking about goals and dreaming, I think the mind came to my mind, uh, and we are talking about body before because you we were talking about sleeping and diet and uh, activities which actually involves your physical body. What about mind? How the mind is important uh, to to set up this kind of well-performing um, living. The mind is the next step. So once we have the body stable and healthy and well, it then becomes possible for the brain and the mind to work. To be clear, the brain is the physical structure. It is your neurons. It is the electricity that passes through your brain. It is the hormones that get created that give us our emotions. And the mind is the emergent property of the brain at least we think that that's where it originates and the mind is that chatter that happens Uh, and what i would encourage people to think about is that the mind can be trained just like your body can be trained we can train our mind and direct our attention towards the things that are important to us in our lives So the first practice that we recommend for everybody who wants to go down the road of health, well-being, and high performance is some sort of a meditative practice, a mindfulness practice. Now, mindfulness is bringing your attention into the present moment, directing your mind into the present moment to pay attention to what is happening here and now. Meditation is the practice of bringing your attention back into the present moment over and over and over again. So for example, you would be sitting, doing nothing, and you'd just be counting your breaths or repeating a mantra. And when you notice that your mind has wandered to something else that is not here and now, you simply bring your attention back into the present moment. So mindfulness is being here now. Meditation is a practice of returning your attention to the present moment. Of course, there's many more layers that you can get into, but at a high level, that's what it's all about. So that is our core practice for the brain and for our mind. The beautiful thing about that is not only does that enable us to control, learn how to control our attention so we can direct our attention towards what matters to us the most in our lives, 
but it also by extension improves our mental health because we know that people who practice mindfulness and meditation have lower risk of depression and anxiety. So it helps us in many different ways. Now, once we have our attention controlled, we then are aware that there's pretty like really two key states that the brain can be in that are important for all of us who are interested in human potential. The first state is a beta brainwave state. If we measured the electrical activity inside your brain, when you're in this state, there would be 16 to 30 cycles of electricity per second pumping through your brain. And this is the state that we're in when we're focused and when we're getting things done. This is your performance execution stage. Like I'm in beta brainwave mode right now talking to you. When I'm on stage, I'm in beta brainwave state. When I'm running a meeting, it's beta brain brainwave state. Like this is going through your to-do list. This is making the phone calls. This is delivering the presentations. This is performing the music, right? Like this is you are in full on beta mode to get stuff done. The key win here is focus. Your attention is in the present. The key risk that you have in this state is distraction, which can pull you out of a brainwave state. And that's what social media does is it basically constantly unrelentingly distracts us. So in this area, we are learning to control our technology intentionally and not to use our technology compulsively. The second state that we get into, <clears throat> excuse me, is the alpha brainwave state. This is a much more relaxed state. It's about 50% is activated. It's sort of eight to 15 hertz if we were to measure the cycles of electricity through the brain. So your 50% is activated. The body, instead of being active and energized, is calm and still. This is the state that we are in when we want to be doing strategic thinking, planning, and learning. So we alternate energy with stillness, energy in beta mode to get stuff done, and stillness in an alpha state to plan, strategize, and learn. And when we alternate those two states, beta mode and alpha mode, that's what enables sustainable high performance over an extended period of time, because we're going from energy to stillness, from performance to recharging over and over and over again. So hopefully that's a little bit of information for people, but the ultimate message here, if you wanted to just take one thing away from it, is that the vast majority of people right now are in high stress beta mode, high activation states all the time, and they're getting burned out. High performers who are healthy and well mentally are those who alternate periods of intense work with deep rest. So don't be afraid to slow down in order to speed up. I hope that makes sense. Totally. The question would be how to keep the balance between those two modes, because it's like you need a huge recovery after training. So I think this kind of balancing uh, should be all over. So how to do you have any recommendation how to get out from beta to get to alpha mode? Alpha mode? Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't, actually don't know if balance is possible, to be honest. And I mm. think that when we look for balance, it's, you know, where it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's almost impossible because when you're in beta mode, you are hoping that, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm on fire here. I need some rest time, but it's not happening. So you feel out of balance. Similarly, when you were too long in an alpha state, you feel, you know, maybe even bored that you need a little bit of action. So what I, suggest to people is that there will be periods of time when you're very intensely working and periods of time where you're in deep relaxation and both of those states are okay. We only end up in trouble when we're all the time in beta stress mode or all the time in rest recovery <laughs> regeneration mode, right? Like even when you're on vacation for three weeks, at the end of that two or three weeks, you're probably like, okay, I'm ready to get back to work now, right? Like there's a balance to be achieved, but it isn't going to happen at the same time we look at balance over the course of a month, a year, maybe even three years. That's what we're looking for. So there's periods of intense work and periods of intense of deep rest. Now, how do we get into beta mode? Hustle performance execute mode. In that case, there's probably two things. Physical activity, activating your body, activates your brain. It's wonderful and it gets you healthy at the same time. Second thing is we defend our attention by turning off the technology that we are not using. So we're turning off our notifications. We are defending our attention from the relentless stream of notifications. 
music can also help you here to psych you up to give you energy so there we can leverage the power of music to give us more energy to perform at a higher level if you look at olympic athletes before they walk up to the blocks to compete the vast majority of them are listening to music through noise canceling headphones i would encourage everyone in business to do the same thing if you're walking into an important meeting make sure that there's music on in the background, in your headphones, the little noise canceling ones, the little earbuds if you need to, to keep it discreet and get yourself psyched up to your favorite music so that your energy is spectacular right before you're about to perform. On the beta mode, the slowing down mode, the recovery and regeneration mode, we are leveraging the power of stillness. In this case, it's okay to sit down. It's okay to go find a park bench. It's okay to sit at your desk and break out the notebook and do the writing. So we're beta mode, performance mode, we're physically energized. In the alpha state, we are physically calm. Similarly, from a mental perspective, we are also mentally calm. This is relaxation. This is bringing your attention into the present moment. This is mindfulness. This is meditation. And the other thing that helps us to get into an alpha state, much like music helps to energize us, we can also use nature to get us out of beta mode and down into an alpha state. So don't be afraid to go for a walk in the park. Don't be afraid to get outside. You can also look at art. Art does wonders for this as well. Anytime that you're looking at trees or plants or the ocean or the water or a river or anywhere in a park outside, that helps you to recover down into that alpha state. So one of the practices I have is on the weekend when my children want to go to the park, I go with them. And I don't bring my phone. I might bring a camera, not my cam, not my phone, just to make sure that I am there with them in a natural environment. And that really helps me to recover and regenerate on the weekends so I can get back to it on Monday morning. Hope that's helpful. It's sort of three tactics on either side that can make a difference and help you get into a beta state or into an alpha state. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's totally helpful. I'm just thinking about the burnouts because sometimes we just kind of crush the limits too far and without noticing it really. So what would you say would be this kind of alarming signs that you should actually shift to the other mo mode or rec or to the, get to the recovery mode? Sure. When it comes to burnout, there's two things to think about. The first one is overwhelm and mm -hmm. the second one is burnout. Now, overwhelm is simply you're tired. And if you rest, you get better. Burnout is you rest, but you don't get better. And so that is really, really important for us because we want to catch ourselves when we're in overwhelmed state because once you're burned out, it takes months to get out of that state. So in overwhelm, you might notice things like you're not sleeping very well. Your resting heart rate, if you measure that, is elevated. You feel constantly stressed. You are at your desk trying to read something on the computer and you've read the same line five times and you still can't understand <laughs> what it is. You're just tired and, ex and exhausted and stressed and fatigued. But if you, for the weekend, disconnect, get away from the phone, don't do any work, get outside, go for a walk, have dinner with your friends, sleep in, on, and then you feel better, that's the state that's in, where you're in overwhelm, in which case we want to start sprinkling a little bit more physical, easy physical activity during the week, improve your nutrition a little bit, get to bed a little bit earlier, a little bit less alcohol, a little bit less caffeine, a little bit more meditation, right? Like every tactic that we can use during the week to help you to recover and regenerate during the week will then keep you from dropping into a state of burnout. Now, burnout is when you're ex chronically exhausted and fatigued and you just can't break out of it. That unfortunately requires weeks, if not months, of focused attention to recovery and regeneration to get you out of that state. That might require you to sleep for 12 hours a night for two to three months. That might require you even take, you know, um, in some very severe circumstances, uh, you know, short-term disability, if, if, if that's a possibility for you, and for most of us, it isn't. So in that case, we're really looking at things like disconnecting from social media, getting great sleep, making sure that we're eating a lot of anti-inflammatory nutrition, which basically means eat the rainbow of fruits and vegetables as much as you possibly can. 
Um, our temptation in both of these states, overwhelm and burnout, is to use foods that are high in sugar because they give us instantaneous energy. The problem is that then that triggers an insulin response and in some cases an adrenaline response, which does help you to survive for half an hour, 30 minutes, but ultimately leads to even more burnout afterwards. So we have to avoid that temptation to fuel our performance with sugars, but to use nutrition as healing and think about what food, what drinks can I have that help me to heal, that help me to repair, to help me to recover. That's things like fresh organic meat, wild fish, multicolored vegetables, various different types of fruits, herbal tea, green tea, and the plethora of beautiful spices that are available to us, all of which have anti-inflammatory effects. So that's the game. So you try to catch it as early as you possibly can and give yourself permission to recover and to regenerate. Give yourself permission to take the time necessary to heal and you fuel that healing with easy exercise beautiful food and incredible sleep hmm. as you said it's good to notice it uh, sooner than later but uh, i think that uh, most of the people doesn't they, they are not really conscious about their feeling or emotions so what would you say how to develop this kind of awareness of co consciousness of my needs and my limits i think that the way that i learned to do this and by the way i have struggled through everything that we have just talked about this is you know hard-earned information and i am by no means perfect I was extraordinarily burned out about 12 years ago. I actually ended up being hospitalized as a result. That's how I figured out sleep, eat, move. Um, during the global pandemic, I think many of us struggled with mental health. So I, that's when I learned all about alpha mode and beta mode and recovery and regeneration and twin cycles of performance and rest. So these are all hard earned insights that I'm sharing with you today. The reason why I'm sharing them is I, I hope that I can save you from having to go through the hospitalization and, and depression and therapy. And you just like read my, you know, read a book and, and you'll be good. But the way that I figured most of this out was through journaling. And when we write about how we're feeling, when we write about what's going on in our lives, the interesting thing that occurs is it gets it out of your head onto paper and you can become the observer rather than being someone who's experiencing it in the moment, which makes it very difficult to view the future. You cannot consider what are the secondary challenges. You cannot consider what are the opportunities. And it feels like you're going to be in this state forever. When we journal about things, it brings it out of your brain onto the paper so that you can then see the trends. You can then observe what's going on. You can go back and read it almost like you're having a conversation with somebody else. And when you do that, you'll see where you need to go quite often. The other thing that you could do is get an external opinion from somebody that you really trust. And I don't mean like random people on the internet who you should completely ignore, or even you know someone in your family who gives you unsolicited advice about how you should live your life. That's a disaster. But someone that you trust, whose opinion you value, and you could have a conversation with them and say, you know what, here's how, some stuff that's going on. You know me quite well. What do you think is something that I could consider right now? And I don't want you to do that constantly with that person because obviously we don't want to be weighing anyone else down. We, but we do want to be able to look to our and find who are our coaches? Who are our mentors? Who are the people that we trust? You might want to ask your doctor about your health. You might want to ask your personal trainer about your physical state. You might want to ask your therapist about your psychology. When we have these expert mentors in our lives, people that we trust, that can help guide us forwards. Think about it. Serena Williams, who's one of the greatest tennis players in history, has a mental skills coach. She has a serve coach. She has a strength coach. She has a forehand coach, right? Like she has <laughs> loads of experts that she relies on and she's the best in the world at what she does. So don't feel bad at all about asking for help. Ask for help around your psychology 
from a therapist. I've done loads of that over the last four or five years. Ask for help from someone who's an expert in physical health on how you might best get into better physical shape if that's the direction that you want to go. In business, ask a coach in your area who can guide you on steps that you might take to grow your business. When we find the right mentors, when we find the right experts to guide us in conjunction with a practice like journaling so that you can see where you are from an external perspective, I think that's a powerful way forward that might really help you. And I know that a lot of this stuff costs money and that's very difficult and financial security insecurity is, is real for many people. And so that's why journaling is a practice that's totally free. You can also use things like audiobooks from true trusted experts, podcasts that you listen to, a true trusted expert. Just be very careful about your sources of information that you gather in and make sure that it is from a trusted web of people with real qualifications that are true experts in the area that you want to grow. How about uh, the inner journey? I mean, you know, you have some inner world and your emotions and you actually have the connection with yourself through your body. And we're saying before, as I said, sleep, eat, mood. So my question would be, do you think that our body is kind of a tool that provides us this high performance or this relationship should be, I don't know, deeper, different? Yes, it should be deep. It can be deeper and different. Actually, we have our bodies, which are beautiful vessels through which we experience this life. That's your brain, that's your muscles, that's your bones, that's your organs. Like that's what enables us to experience food or to move, to speak, to think. Like all of that comes from our bodies. We have our thoughts and our mind. That's the emergent property of the brain, which gives us this experience and this consciousness. It enables us to do the work that we do, play music, create art, build relationships. Every aspect of our lives that's meaningful is an emergent pr property of the brain and the mind and our consciousness. So that's the mind-body component that people talk about a lot. And then as you mentioned, we have emotions. Now, as a physiologist, I look at emotions and the way that we create emotions inside the body is through chemicals called hormones. So for example, if you get startled, a hormone gets released into your body called adrenaline, which then circulates around, which you feel as that sort of, I'm scared my hands are shaking, right? That's an, that's an emotion, but it's based on a chemical. There's happy hormones and chemicals. There's love emotions and chemicals like oxytocin, right? Like there's uh, hormones related to every emotion. Emotions are what brings light to our lives or in some cases darkness as well. But we don't want to go through life always happy. In order to understand what happiness is, sometimes we need to feel sad. In order to feel excited, sometimes we need to feel anxious. In order to feel joy, sometimes we need to feel a little bit of depression. Challenges emerge when we're in any of those states for long periods of time. So, you know, if you're feeling a little bit down for a few hours, no big deal. That's part of life. But if you're feeling depressed for months, then that is a significant challenge. And the longer that we stay in any of these states, the more difficult it becomes to get ourselves um, out of that state. So variety is this variety of emotions really is the spice of life. And emotions are information for us. If we are doing something and we feel joyful, that's information that maybe we could have a little bit more of that or install a little bit more of that particular activity or experience into our lives. Happiness as well. Who are the people? Where are the places? What are the pursuits that bring us happiness and joy? When we journal about that, when we think about that, it becomes possible to navigate life, to spend more time doing those sorts of things. When we understand what makes us happy and what makes us maybe a little bit less happy, we can just navigate and nudge our lives in the right direction. Emotions are information. If we're fearful about something, it's really worth leaning into that and understanding what it is that is causing us to experience that fear. That's very important information. Sometimes it's legit, right? If you're staring over the edge of a cliff, the fear is as a result of the fact that if you jump off that cliff, you will die. That is a legitimate fear. Um, but sometimes when we're scared of doing something at work, it's not the actual thing itself that's scaring us. It's perhaps 
what other people might think about us if we fail, right? It's that external judgment that might be making us feel scared, which could then limit us. And that would be worth leaning into to see if we can liberate ourselves from that need for external validation such that we can proceed in our careers and our lives with without fear that limits us. So emotions are critically important as adding beauty and depth to our lives. And when we're aware of our emotions as information and we explore those emotions, that enables us to nudge our lives in the right direction to experience more of the emotions that we want to have and less of the emotions that we don't want to have. Sometimes that leads us to incredibly difficult decisions, but it is those decisions that change the trajectory of our lives for the better if we're able to make the right ones. Now, there's one level deeper as well, and that is spirituality. And while I am not a deeply spiritual person, I am fascinated by spirituality. I've traveled the world to explore different types of spirituality, whether it's the mountains in India or the three religious centers in Jerusalem or um, ancient pyramids in Egypt and temples in Peru. Like I've gone all over the planet to explore this, although I myself um, am a bit of an atheist. So I know that's a bit of a contradiction, but I'm fascinated by spirituality. And in my world, spirituality presents as community and connection. And when we are deeply connected with people that we love in communities that elevate us, that make us better people, then that to me is one of the most important capstones to all of this is surrounding ourselves with people who love us, people who elevate us, people who challenge us, people who support us, and that we do the same for them. The vast majority of the world right now, unfortunately, on social media, uh, often are you know tearing others down to build themselves up. That's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for support. We're looking for love. We're looking for challenge we're looking for community in a very positive way that elevates us and then when we elevate others so when you back to your connection about is it more than just mind body up absolutely it is emotions play a huge role and that spiritual connection then provides that very deep life meaning and if you are so fortunate to have a faith that enables you to have that through um some sort of practice that 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 gives that to you that's wonderful for me that practice happens to have emerged as community and connection with the people that i love hmm. i get to my dreams right now like thinking about <laughs> the whole world as a really trustful uh, and full of love community should be a different world wouldn't be wouldn't uh, it like imagine if the world was geared towards helping individuals reach their individ everyone reaching their own potential eliminating every systematic barrier to humans reaching their potential like everyone having clean drinking water it's very easy to do that everyone having access to electricity everyone having access to education like this is the basics we could do that so easily and although doing that for the entire world seems overwhelming if every single one of us did something that we can do in our little network of people to move the world in the right direction collectively that will have a massive difference so we don't need to change the world although it would be super cool to do that the world in quotes might just be you and your five friends and that's enough that's okay it could be you and your classroom your you and your business you and your family whatever it happens to be we're just moving the needle slightly forwards in the things that we care about the most Hmm. So again, we are kind of segmenting the dreams to kind of small goals and small steps that actually can really make a change, right? Exactly. That's the whole purpose behind what we're doing. Mm. What about, because you, you were saying it would be, I just saw the vision about each people aiming their own, uh, the highest potential of them. What, what stops people from, from getting there? Yeah, you know, if I had the answer, the true answer to that, um, m- wow, I could really, I think it, I, I could make a big difference. I think that there are, are many things that limit us. Some of those are systematic in nature. 
uh, society, unfortunately, has been built to limit mm-hmm. certain groups of people, and that's just the reality of this of of the sad nature of the world that has existed up until this point in time. I'm really working hard right now to try to eliminate systematic barriers to human potential, however those exist in our world. So there is that that we have to overcome in our individual lives. I think that there could be some limitations that we put on ourselves. Either we feel like we don't deserve it, or we feel like we don't have the ability, or we're afraid of failure for whatever reason. And so, although we can work to change systematic and tear down systematic barriers to human potential, an example would be making sure that young women are educated, right? Like we want to make sure that that's happening around the planet. The benefits of that have been shown over and over and over again. Um, and as a father of a 13 year old girl, that's a high priority for me, right? That's a massive project, but individually we could be thinking about what do I want to do and what's holding me back? And is that whatever is holding me back? Is that internal or external? If it's external, can I find a way around that thing that is externally holding me back? And if it's internal, why am I doing that? Why am I not going for it? What am I afraid of? And how can I then get the support necessary such that the risk that I am taking to achieve that thing that I'm seeking to accomplish, there's more support than there is risk. So let's say that you're going to go do your first big presentation at work and you're really nervous and you're very scared. What support do you need to make sure that that is a success? So that would be planning out your presentation, practicing it a number of times, getting feedback from your colleagues in advance of the actual presentation itself, rehearsing it on your own, videotaping it, reviewing the videotape, like all of those things to make sure that it's a success. Takes a lot of work. And then making sure that afterwards you deconstruct the performance with people that you trust. So after I do a keynote presentation, for example, I will take the video file and go work on that with my public speaking coach so I have good feedback from people that I trust. I don't typically give much thought to anyone who randomly comments on my performance who I don't know. Obviously, you know, I'll take that into account a little bit, but in general, the people that I look to for that deconstruction are people that I trust. So there's a lot there, but it really comes down to internal versus external. When it's external, can we go around it? When it's internal, what's the true source of it, the limiting factor, and can we break that down inside of us? That's where meditation comes into play. That's where journaling comes into play. That's where coaching comes into play. That's where practice comes into play. And um, that results at the end of the at the end of all of this work in a incredible growth that's possible if we are willing to do that work and it seems overwhelming but in fact it can be kind of fun because you end up in a much much better place and the the place we all wanted to be right so it's good to know it exists actually Uh, coming back to the performance optimization I was wondering because this is the term that actually connects you with sport or maybe business or a career or, you know, all those achievements that you have in your life. What about things like creativity, uh, relationships, love? Do we need to perform high there as well? <laughs> you know, it's it's so interesting that when we we think about this, we often use the term, you know, in order to perform, we have to work harder. Hmm. And in fact, it's the opposite. You actually need to relax into it. And creativity specifically, if we actually look at the brain, when we are creative, when we are ideating, when we're problem solving, when we're innovating, the brain is in an incredibly relaxed state, almost asleep. So you're lower than alpha, which we talked about before, but above delta, which is sleep. And it's a, it's actually called a theta brainwave state. You're actually almost um, daydreaming. It's that relaxed. You've probably felt this before if you've ever, ever been out for a long walk without your phone and you notice <laughs> that your mind starts wandering. That's a theta brainwave state that's hyper creative. Musicians will be very familiar with this if you've ever written music authors as well if you've ever tried to write a story 
it's a beautiful practice for um, building create creative the creative muscle of your brain. And so that state when we are creative is actually deeply relaxed, no tension whatsoever. So it's not hard. It's actually as easy as you can possibly make it with no expectations, no judgment whatsoever. Judgment destroys creativity. So it's, again, back to that idea of slowing down in order to speed up. The answer to most of our challenges, especially if you're listening to this podcast and you were 50 minutes in, you're still here. You are clearly invested in health, well-being, and high performance. But we're not trying to accomplish this by doing things harder. We're trying to do accomplish this by doing things better, smarter, and easier, in fact. So it's quite counterintuitive, and it's an art as well as a science. And it can be practiced and developed. And of course, you mentioned love, too. I think that love is without question the most powerful force that humans can experience. And it's probably beyond the scope of what we can get into in this podcast. But I do believe that when we work on all of these different things and we build these different capacities up in our lives, it becomes easier to love, to, to love and it becomes, more importantly, almost easier to allow ourselves to be loved. And when those two things start to occur, all of a sudden, true magic emerges in our lives. It's very easy with our children, right? And so we can maybe try to build that up in other aspects of our lives. And I notice now that I'm getting older, I'm now in my 50s. I can't believe that I'm actually in my 50s right now. I feel like I'm 30. But um, I've noticed my friends that I've had for decades, we're all telling each other how much we love each other now, whereas we never would have done that before. But now it's very easy for me to look at a friend and say, hey, you know what? I just lo I love you so much. You're a great, like, love spending time with you. That word is becoming easier to say for me at this stage of my life. And so the sooner we can build that in, the sooner that we can acknowledge it, the sooner that we can cultivate that, I think the, the better our lives are going to be. <laughs> I couldn't think of the better sum up, actually, of our conversation about... Uh high optimization uh, of the performance, which actually led us to the idea that we just have to let it go and release and relax and listen to our inner voices, as we were saying. So thank you very much, Greg. And I hope oh. we can all implement all those small steps in our real everyday life. I'm so honored to have been here and spent some time with you. And um, I loved the thinking pa path that you took me on. It was so much fun. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. Totally. Thank you.